Sponsored by Eero. Get free overnight shipping with your order. Link in the description. Android 10 has begun rolling out, starting first with Google's own Pixel phones. iOS 13 should be rolling out in about two weeks, just before Apple launches its next batch of iPhones. And as much as they are completely different operating systems from completely different companies with completely different philosophies behind them, they're kind of doing some similar things this time around. To talk all about it, I've got Android Central's managing editor, Daniel Bader, on the line. I'm Renee Ritchie, and this is Vector. So the big ding against Android has always been that new versions don't matter that much because between somewhere between vendors and carriers, very few phones actually get the updates, especially over time. By comparison, the current version of iOS is at around 90% adoption right now. And you know Apple is just gonna love to throw that stat up on stage. So my question to you is, do you think mainline actually helps? And how much of this is really a nerd enthusiast problem versus a real mainstream consumer issue. So yes, uh, fundamentally Android and iOS are different. They're structurally different. The importance of receiving a platform update on the day it's released to everybody is not as important on Android as it is on iOS because of um, monthly or quarterly security updates that also now bundle important fixes. Uh, that being said, the frequency and reliability of platform updates has been increasing on the Android side over the past couple of years. And the uh, delta between Google releasing a platform update in late summer and the big manufacturers, notably Samsung, releasing updates for their customers in early the early part of the following year has shortened. That window is getting shorter. And two things can be... Uh, attributed to that. Well, three things. As I said, the the, the prevalence of security updates um, is is now a part of the the system. So the manufacturers are getting them from Google. They're passing them along to the carriers, and the carriers are doing a better job of giving them to customers on a regular basis. At the same time, we have. Um, mainline and and before that treble making it easier for manufacturers to compartmentalize those platform updates and separate them from the hardware driver updates that are needed to uh, bring over a big platform improvement so you have um, a shorter time window but you also have manufacturers having to do less work to bring those platform updates to their customers if you told me a few years ago that one of the headline features of both Android and iOS would be dark mode, I'd have totally believed you because dark mode, I think like only emoji are more popular. Now, personally, I love the idea of dark mode, dark mode, all the things, but I also find it kind of oppressive in practice. Like it's great at night so you don't shine glare in your eyes or get glare from your significant other, but I end up going back to light mode really quickly during the day. The way Apple is handling dark mode in iOS 13 is clever with dynamic semantic colors. So an app developer just says they want this kind of control in like blue and the system figures it out even for different modes and even across things like iPhone and iPad and now Mac OS as well. There's even a new font system as well, finally, but no full on theme kit, at least not yet. So Android still wins hands down when it comes to customization. But that's what makes me curious here. Given Android is so customizable already, why the need for a system-wide dark mode? What problem is it solving and how is it working for you so far? You're right, dark theme has been around in some respects on some phones for years. And it's been up to app developers to even build in their own uh, dark modes if customers clamor for them. Um, with Android 10, I think Google is saying, hey, we're giving you more of a structure here. We're giving you more of a of, of an API and SDK based theme theme work, uh, framework that you can use to theme phones consistently. And that has been something Android has lacked over the years is consistent design throughout uh, the entire ecosystem, considering that so many companies like Samsung enjoy their own unique looks and One UI is so different from Google's own material theme-based Android um, that I don't think they'll ever um, achieve the consistency that, they, that they're looking for. I think this is a step in the right direction, but 
I don't even think Google wants to step on that semantic design, um, you know, uh, aspiration as as Apple because they're not they're they're not giving guidelines for 10 15 phones they're giving guidelines for 10 or 15,000 phones and that'll just never work on at scale you mentioned gestures earlier. iOS has got a whole new gesture navigation system with the iPhone 10 and the loss of the home button a couple of years ago. Now with iOS 13 and iPad OS, there's like this silly level of anything you can drag, you can make a window and you have to swipe up twice to get through the dock to the workspaces. And it's a ton of additional power, but at the cost of a ton of additional complexity. And I wonder how many people who are used to just clicking that home button will feel about it because I've been doing it for months and I'm still fiddling and misfiring at times. So you're getting a kind of iPhone 10 style gesture navigation system with Android 10 as well. But Android has also had multi-window for a while now. And Google is even introducing support for apps that have different states on foldable devices like the just re-announced Galaxy Fold. How, how well does all that stuff fit together and how well is that working for you? Google put out uh, the developer um, side of, of the uh, Android engineer team put out a, a really interesting um, blog post and accompanying charts when they announced that they were moving to a gesture navigation system for Android 10. And what they said was that as phones get bigger and people need to be able to use them with one thumb, the three button navigation system just wasn't tenable. Uh, it, it was uncomfortable for people to reach a home button if it was on the left side of the phone and vice versa. Um, Samsung had its own way. Uh, it flipped the buttons around. So there was no consistency among the most popular Android devices uh, in terms of navigation. So I think what, what Google is trying to do is just bite the bullet and say, we've had this legacy back button for 10 years now, and we need to get app developers, we need to force app developers to redesign their apps away from the slide in hamburger menu, at least relying on those for navigation, because we know that that's actually where menus go to die. And we saw that with iOS and we're seeing it with Android as well. But Google, as they acknowledge with, with the misfire of Android Pi's navigation system, that having a pill plus a pill gesture area plus a dedicated back button is there's so much cognitive dissonance around that that people just get angry they get angry at their phones and the last thing google wants is for people to get angry when they use their phones especially considering we use it longer today than we've ever used them before this gesture navigation system in android 10 is a band-aid that i think in the long run will will actually heal much better than than the Android 9 wound that uh, has just been festering. So there's, it, it's easy for, for people to say that Google copied Apple, but I think they copied the right things because the, if you've used an iPhone, if you use an iPad, it's consistent. And yes, it adds a little bit more complexity when it comes to things like opening up the multitasking window, but You've given, you know, if you give somebody coming from an iPhone 7 to an iPhone 10, the new gesture navigation system, they get used to it in 10 seconds. So I'm not too worried about it. But you're right, from, the, from an iPad OS perspective, um, th I mean, there's no corollary on Android because the Android tablets are terrible and Chromebooks have a completely different way of navigation. However, uh, there is, you know, something to be said for Google just trying to fix the thing that's broken on the thing that affects most people, which is phones. Privacy. And I'm going to quote this again because I really like it. I think Facebook and Cambridge Analytica have finally done for privacy what Windows XP and malware did for security, and that is force people and vendors to really start paying attention. But the platforms are doing it in such different ways. They've all had an endless series of embarrassments and scandals, of course. But Google, like Facebook, seems to be focusing all of the attention on app permissions and vowing to protect our data from developers. While Apple, on the other hand, is specifically targeting Google and Facebook and not only locking them out, but going out of their way to lock Apple themselves out as well. 
Obviously, because of the differences in business model, that's something Google may not be willing to do. Personally, I think they should just be straight about it. Just like drop any pretense of first party privacy concern and try to hard sell us, like really hard sell us on the advantage of giving them our data and what that gives back to us and then letting us decide if that's worth it or not. But I'm really curious, what's your take on all this? Yeah, it's it's really interesting because Google um, with Android 10 is introducing you know per app per location pop ups uh, similar. I, I don't remember the iOS version, but uh, that that it was introduced. But when an app can only get your location when you're in the app itself. Um, that dialogue is now coming to Android 10. It's long overdue, and it's something that app developers have taken advantage of for years to the extent where weather apps were sending your date, your your location data to you know third party um, aggregators for years with nobody knowing about it because they they weren't disclosed properly and they weren't using public APIs. And it's it's something that. I think Google wants to be seen as doing a better job with. This is as much about their um, public perception of taking privacy seriously as it is about actually implementing um, stringent and unassailable privacy policies in Android. At the same time, it doesn't matter if Google is still giving you a single opt-in for all of its privacy right for all of its privacy settings right when you load the operating system for the first time. So when you rush through your login experience because you want to start using your brand new phone, not realizing that you're giving blanket permissions to Google to take all of your data and, and harvest it and improve your ad experience as a result, that is problematic. And that is something that um, Google will never, I, I think, admit to that they, they, they can't be a good actor in one sense with Android and a bad actor uh, by not taking your own privacy seriously um, as, as a business model. All right, so what else excites you about Android 10? Where do you think Google still has the advantage and where do you think that maybe they should take a page out of Apple's book? I think gesture nav is, is great. I think it really does improve the experience once you get used to it. I think the addition of uh, foldable support is you know, setting the stage for the next 10 years. I'm really excited for foldables. I, I I loved the Galaxy Fold when I first used it in April. I'm so excited to get the new updated, more uh, robust version later this month. Um, at the same time, Android 10, it also introduces a metal equivalent called Angle, which allows app developers to access uh, low, you know, low level graphics APIs um, in ways that they haven't before, they they could sort of bypass the OpenGL ES sub you know layer and just go straight to the uh, graphics drivers. Um, this will allow phones with less powerful GPUs to um, to get access to 3D rendering effects and get and have games play uh, more uh, smoothly. I think that's a really nice step. I think scoped storage, which isolates the storage of a particular app, uh, isolates the storage data of a particular app, is while not forced in, in Android 10, will be forced in Android 11. Um, I think just the overall maturity and stability of Android 10 is not something that can be overstated. And last question, where do you think iOS wins? What excites you about iOS 13? And where do you think Apple should take a page from the Android book? So uh, there's a couple of things I really like, uh, and it mainly comes down to the camera. I think, uh, you know, Google, their camera app sucks. I'll put it frankly, they're, it's really, really not a great experience. Yes, you have to differentiate between Google's camera and the overall camera APIs available to third party manufa to manufacturers um, you know Samsung's camera LG's camera are they're fine they're they're great but I'm just saying on a on a Android 10 level um, it's not even close iOS 13 introduces video editing within the actual uh, gallery editor it introduces a new photos app which takes a page from Google Photos let's admit but at the same time, uh, it's all on device and it does a lot of that processing without having to upload your data to the cloud, which I appreciate. I think the uh, addition of more robust editing features is something that Google Photos desperately needs it, as it takes over from the default gallery apps of many phones. 
Android just needs a better gallery. It needs a better uh, editing system. It doesn't have that yet. Uh, and overall, I just think that there are, um, you know, I like the fact that Apple is redesigning its its maps and giving people more data. I think that rollout will take years and we'll probably, we'll need to talk about this in 2021 to see whether they actually fulfilled that promise. Um, but I think the, I think iOS 13 is exactly like Android 10. It is a very iterative minor update for the iPhone um, it's a much more significant one for the iPad, but it's not even iOS 13 on the iPad. So what are we even talking about? Thanks, Daniel. You can read his work at androidcentral.com and follow him on Twitter and Instagram at journeydan. And you really should. He's one of the smartest people in tech. And you should also check out Eero and save yourself from some horrible Wi-Fi. Now, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Having to flip your phone from Wi-Fi to LTE because your old school router just wouldn't reach from the living room to the bedroom and then forgetting to flip it back again before binging on YouTube. That was my own personal nightmare, but Eero fixed it. I just plugged in the router, plugged in the beacons and bam, dead zones gone. Just silky smooth, super fast Wi-Fi everywhere. And if you're dealing with deadlines the way I was, you can get it fixed as soon as tomorrow. Just go to eero.com slash vector and enter code vector at checkout to get free overnight shipping with your order. That's eero.com slash vector code vector at checkout to get your Eero delivered with free overnight shipping. You have to use a URL to receive this offer. That's eero.com slash vector code vector. Thanks, Eero, and thanks to all of you for your support. I've been covering iOS 13 for months, and Android Central's been doing the same with Android 10. Two very different operating systems from two very different companies, strangely going in somewhat similar, but not exactly the same direction. So now I wanna hear from you. Hit like if you do, subscribe if you haven't already, and Android queue up that bell gizmo so you don't miss the next video. Then hit up the comments and let me know what you think about iOS 13 versus Android 10. And don't hold back. Thank you for watching and see you next video.